Hello, everybody. This is Munson Steed, and welcome to Health IQ. So, as always, we want to make sure that your intelligence is actually going up as it relates to your health. Key point, finding the right professional for your health. For me, I am one of the most fortunate people in the entire world. I get to speak to some of the best practitioners of health who are dedicated, who have been in our community, who want accessibility and disparities to be erased. Of course, we want to educate and entertain. But you know, when you go to HBCU, there's something that's just always so real. There's so much love. There's so much excitement. The professors are so hard on you. And then you find yourself having to make a decision. Will I go to the AC, hang out with Stacey Abrams, or maybe Kamala Harris at Howard, or hmm, maybe hang out in the DMV close enough, but so that you could study and become a doctor and end up at Hampton. Well, you know, HU, the other HU, the two HUs have got this huge portal of phenomenal, educated, dynamic brothers and sisters coming out of Hampton. I'm gonna introduce you to one right now. Hello, Dr. Ebony, Vincent, how are you? Hello, I am very good. How are you? I'm so proud to see you again. <laughs> Obviously, I can uh, watch you on the tube, but I, I, I always caution individuals to understand the accessibility and the excitement that you bring to not only television, but to your practice to inspire all the Black girl magic is so important for our community. So Thank how does you. it feel to be that young Black girl who's in freshman year trying to decide what she's doing at Hampton with all the competition, beautiful as you are, intelligent as you are, stay focused. What'd you think freshman year? Were you gonna make it? You know what? <laughs> it's, it's a lot to over to undertake when you're first entering campus, everything's going on, you have just, you're overwhelmed. Your senses are, are definitely overwhelmed. Um, but I walked in as a biology major and you know what was specific and what I love most about my Hampton University is that I really felt like my advisors really cared. Like I literally had my advisor, Mr. Davis, he was on me like nobody's business. I remember our first meeting, he was like, okay, so where are you from? What do you wanna be? You wanna be a doctor, huh? And you're gonna play volleyball? Oh, okay. So this is what you need to do. I mean, he was he would check in like literally one every once every two weeks, once a week. He would be checking in like, hey, I saw what your quiz score was. Doctors don't get these grades. You gotta pick it up, you know. <laughs> so I mean, it wasn't like you're just flying by the seat of the wind, you know. Like I feel like I had a built-in infrastructure that literally cared what my future was gonna be at my HBCU. Like I can name my advisors or my teacher by name. They know me. And it wasn't like I was just a number in a class. So uh, while I was overwhelmed, I did feel a sense of uh, me being grounded, you know? And I had um, a sense of pride about that, that other people were rooting for me. So I had no choice but to, to be my best, you know? So um, that I, that's why I'm so, uh, so much of, um, my credit goes to Hampton. A lot of my uh, friends are from Hampton. A lot of the people I connect with are from Hampton and other HBCUs. Um, so yeah, that freshman kid that was uh, pretty overwhelmed kind of got it together quickly. <laughs> you know, I, I think those are the nurturing ideas and the ideology of increased expectation. I mean, when you think about um, any HBCU, there is someone who says, increase your expectation, increase oh, yeah. your expectation. There, we have some expectations of you. So let us just to begin to kind of, what is it that <laughs> you said what? Oh, okay. Expectation is. Okay. Exactly. Yes. It's a B standard of excellence at Hampton University, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> just in case you didn't know. I love it. So you leave there, you have to make a decision. You obviously MCAT plays a role in all of this. You ACE the MCAT, where do you go to med school? So that was actually not my journey. Uh, no. That was supposed to be my journey, but here's what really happened. 
Um, because I was a student athlete, I actually needed two classes that made me eligible to apply to medical school. So I did take the MCAT, but yet I wasn't able to apply because I didn't have like a pharmacology biochemistry. I think that's, those are the classes if I remember correctly. Um, so I had to do a post -bac program. So I actually applied to a post -bac program and got in at Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. And, you know, my journey is so interesting because I was in my first year in my, as a biomed student and I went to church, uh, found a church home and who did I sit next to was a woman who offered me a full scholarship to do an extra year at PCOM to get a master's degree in biomedical science. So I, like a, song. a what? Do it? A song. I know, won't he do, do it? it? Yes, won't he do, do it? it? I'm yes, just, he, he said he won't would. He, <laughs> <laughs> he said he would. No, seriously, it was just really bizarre. I remember being I'm in serious. church and she asked me for a, a piece of gum and then she looked at me and she was like, what do you do? I was like, I'm a student here. I know nobody. I am trying to figure it out in Philadelphia. And she was like, you look like you would be a perfect candidate for my scholarship program. And I got a full scholarship to do a master's in biomedical science. Uh, I got to stay at the university that already accepted me. And so, I mean, and I, I loved that degree. I got to do research. I got a chance to do a lot more shadowing of physicians. And without that time, I don't think I would have even found the field of podiatry because I was able to shadow uh, orthopedic, shadow a, a heart surgeon, shadow an OBGYN, and podiatry was the last field that I actually shadowed. Um, and so I, I'll be honest, I didn't really, uh, it wasn't even on my radar, the field of podiatry prior to me, you know, having this experience in my master's program. Um, and so, yeah, after, after all my shadowing experience, I kind of like took a step back and looked at my life and was like, okay, so it's bigger than, you know, my career. It's also my life, my lifestyle, what I want to be, what I want to do with it. Um, and I chose to apply to podiatry school. Well, I love that. The idea, yeah. you know, you have this thing baking with God, you think you're on your plan and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you say, oh, you want to know how close an angel will be? You know, you, you want to know how close a miracle will happen? You just want to go, oh, <laughs> if you obey and find you a church home, something might happen good for you. You know, you're something. supposed to have a church home. Something, somebody <laughs> might be there, might be this angel that'll look in you and hear me and hear my voice and say, um, exactly. I think you should be here. Uh, and then being patient. You, you have to be patient. You found this beautiful calling. And when you found your calling, how did you know it? Because I think many are looking for a calling and are going to look to what your answer is to kind of get a vision of how you found something that you could love and do and heal as a healer. Right. Oh, you know, I think that a lot of people will find what they don't want to do before they find what they do want to do. <laughs> um, and I think that that was completely me. I mean, I have done, like I said, a bunch of shadowing, a lot of physicians. I even did a stint at, um, as a pathologist, you know, with the coroner's office, like, and so I was just ticking things off the box, like, "Ooh, I don't like that. Mm -mm, I can't do this. This <laughs> This sounds like another show. I just want you to know it's yeah. starting to sound like <laughs> You know, the medical shadow. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I was doing it all. I was just kind of like, I need to figure it out. I even um, tried to do uh, or thought about doing research. Um, but no, I think that it hit me that I wanted to be a podiatrist because I had done enough of the work to shadow people. And I looked at the podiatrist lifestyle and I looked at the podiatrist work. And I said, you know, this is a medical professional that's great with their hands knows science in the background and most importantly they're happy like podiatrists are generally happy people because they're able to make their patients happy you know and that's kind of like exuded my spirit and I didn't want to you know have emotional casualties after you know being a part of a field that I didn't absolutely love like I don't want I didn't want to have that physician burnout or the lack of uh, consciousness with my empathy because I'm just, uh, I'm tired and I don't care, you know? Like I definitely wanted to be in a field where I can do the, do the best I can for my patients, but also take that time and do the best that I can for, to make my whole life um, what, I, what I envisioned. You know, I really love the idea of 
my feet are killing me on TLC, where you know we have this beautiful, dynamic, studied, learned, compassionate physician. Why don't we take a look at that? I think that would be interesting for our audience to really see. Yeah. Is that cool? Okay. Let's That's go cool. for it. All right. The healer. <laughs> so it, it's strong. You, you've it got to have a true commitment to changing lives. And that kind of brings us up to true awareness and having an advocate and being able to trust. Uh, we've seen the disparities, obviously, with COVID. Um, when patients come to you and mm -hmm. they look you in the eye and you make that connection, what type of compassion and what do you really know, particularly for our Black patients that are looking for answers from you? So in particular, my Black patients are already very skeptical of uh, doctors in general. Oftentimes I am their second or third uh, consult or their second or third opinion. Um, I think that it's my job to slowly and methodically explain what I think their condition is. I think oftentimes we get lost in translation with the communication with one another, um, especially if you don't take the time to make sure that person understands it. Like for my patient in the show, um, I just don't think that he ever got an accurate diagnosis of what his wounds were. Like he didn't even really know that there were different types of wounds and that could have a, a revelation as to what was going on inside of his body. So for instance, like you could have wounds because you have venous problems, like your veins are just collapsed and that's why you're just continuing to drain. Or you could have an arterial artery that's because you have something wrong with the actual blood flow down to your foot. Um, there's several other reasons as to why you could have an ulceration and finding out the reason why gives a great picture as to how to go forward and heal it. So, you know, I think that my biggest thing when I'm, I'm dealing with patients who probably have a negative history with medicine um, or, or just don't have, you know, a, a background that can make them understand is for me to explain what I think is going on and then have them explain it back to me and then explain the plan and then have them explain it back to me. So that way we're on like the best page possible because I don't want us to get lost in translation because I think that's the biggest thing with um, patient compliance and with um, just overall healing. So when you see that, most people, at least for me, the question was, what was the remedy how did you connect? What was next? We hadn't, obviously we want people to tune in so that they can really think about care. I think the more all of us learn about healthcare and how yeah. to create a relationship. Um, I am so proud of you because you. It's, it's a process. And, and I, you know, I literally steal every time I'm here so that I can <laughs> give people, um, you know, you want a, a, a physician that has a methodology. And I, I right. love the fact that you're like, I'm here to give you counsel, but I need you to receive it. Yeah. And you can't advocate <laughs> for yourself if you don't understand what I'm saying you need to do. So thinking about that and thinking about our community, what are some of the do's and don'ts when someone begins to know that there's something a little bit more abnormal to that foot? It's no longer just looking like a normal sore. There's something different. What should they do before it gets to the state that he's wrapping his foot? So, you I mean, you definitely want to have a good family medicine doctor. You def That's kind of the staple that you want to have. You want to be going to a yearly physical where someone's looking you up from head to toe and talking to you about every single thing. And they're, they're looking at the whole big picture of your health. The family doctors are basically the gatekeepers to all of the specialists, right? So uh, my brother is a family medicine doctor and he refers patients to whoever needs to be referred to. Like he can refer you to cardiology, he can refer you to podiatry, he can refer you to ortho, you know? And once you get into that bubble, that health bubble, I'm directly in contact with that person's family medicine doctor. I'm sending notes like, hey, you sent this patient to me, thank you very much for trusting me with their care. This is what's going on, you know? And we're in communication. You have a team of doctors behind you. 
And I think that's what patients need to be aware of is how the medical system actually works. Um, insurance is very different. It, it, it's very confusing, even to doctors it's confusing, but to patients, it could be even more so. If you have an HMO where you have to see this group of doctors, they should all be in communication with each other. If you have a PPO and you don't have a regular visits with your family doctor and you're trying to piecemeal your situation together, that's when things get a little dicey, I think. Um, but it's still completely, it's great because you can choose your doctor and then you can make sure that your doctors communicate with each other. But you have to understand that you're going to need to take your notes. You're going to provide fax numbers. You're going to have to make sure that your all of your physicians are in communication about your health. Um, I, I can share like a, a quick story without any details is, you know, one, one of my patients, uh, a black woman from uh, Los Angeles comes to me thinking that she just needs her toenail, just take it off, my toenail hurts, right? And I go in and I examine her and I'm like, this is a lot deeper than just your toenail hurting. You have um, a blockage somewhere in your blood flow in your arteries. If I take the toenail, I can create a wound and then your toe will literally fall off. Like you need a vascular surgeon. And so I got on the phone with some of my contacts in LA. I'm like, this is the person you need to go to. She went there, she got revascularized and now her toe doesn't hurt and she no longer has pain. So it's just like, you, you might think you know what you need. And so you're going to that person to fix what you think is necessary but you have to know that there's a deeper process and kind of trust that they're specialists for a reason. Does that make sense? You went to Hampton, you know you're talking, right? Yeah. You know, you, yeah, you know what I'm <laughs> yeah I, I, I'm, I appreciate the connection because on Health IQ, we really wanna make sure that people get the concept. And I think right. number one, before you get to a foot doctor and you're having a problem, have your own family physician that you go to. If you are getting past 45, I would say even 40, you probably want to get that routine biannual, just so you don't have as many surprises. Yeah. Uh, things don't crop up, particularly if you have insurance, use it. Um, that's just my thing. Um, the agree. other thing <laughs> is, you know, test, you know, um, as you get older, there are tests that you should keep up with, you know. The other thing is a baseline. I think all of us, particularly in our health at Health IQ, like to say baseline. So I really love how you said family doctor, family physician, and then you are connected within the spoke of your health bubble. And I love that because now you have advocates. You've got people that you have a personal relationship with. They've given you the references and there's a, a process. So I love the evolution that you shared. But for many of our communities, there are manageable diseases that actually end up causing them to have to kind of meet with you because at that point whether it's loss of a foot open wound things like diabetes create additional complications what can we know about that and share with our audience just to kind of give them a heads up that things could be going awry right well, I mean, you probably know that the conversation is a lot deeper <laughs> about our overall communities and health and access to everything. But, you know, to put it succinctly, uh, diabetes type two is preventable. A lot of times people are like, well, my mom and dad had it. My uncles have it. Everybody had type two diabetes. It's genetic. No, you can prevent this from happening to you. Essentially, we need to eat better or eat less and work out more. <laughs> um, oftentimes that your body is just so overwhelmed with bad nutrients and, and sugars that uh, diabetes happens. And then that's when you have, you know, blindness because of diabetes, you have neuropathy, you can't feel your feet. And then you're walking around and you have no idea that there's a huge open festering wound that is on the bottom of your foot. And then that's when you come see the podiatrist. But by that time, your, your blood sugar is completely elevated. You're, you have no feeling in your feet. And then we have this horrible conversation about what needs to be amputated to save your life. And unfortunately in the black and brown communities, we're, we're getting far too many amputations at a rate that is out of control and completely preventable. Our um, rates of dialysis are uh, incredibly high too. Like people who need to be on 
uh, on dialysis because they have end stage renal failure due to type two diabetes. Like it's just a litter, it's a domino effect that happens that all could be prevented. And and they think that's the biggest thing too. Like we're we're kind of chasing our tails here sometimes. We need to start with prevention before it gets to that point. Well, I love that because that's that's a personal intervention versus a systematic uh, intervention. And I think it's something that we do control. But when you think about the community and its relationship to our feet, do we take enough time or how should we even inspect our feet and know the do's and don'ts about, you know, where we really need to, at some point, this is something I need to go see my podiatrist for. Right. So certain things that you definitely need to pay attention to is swelling. If you have swelling in both of your feet, that's uncontrollable and you didn't sustain an, an injury. That's something that you definitely need to be seen for because a lot of times people don't realize they have an underlying heart defect or heart uh, cardiac heart failure because of abnormal swelling in your limbs. Other things to look for are um, abnormal um, like lesions on the skin. If you have something that's very dark with irregular borders, that could mean something. Um, other things are just more so maintenance. You need to moisturize your feet every day. Dry, callous skin that can create open wounds as well. Um, you need to be wearing proper shoes, proper socks. Fungus can also be a very uh, bad hygienic deterrent that can create more problems for you in the future. Um, so inspecting your feet every day, washing and making sure everything um, is maintained on a daily basis is um, always a great idea. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the signs of peripheral neuropathy, if you have nerve pain in two feet, as opposed to nerve pain in one foot, two feet, it's a systemic problem. One foot, it's probably an acute issue that can be solved uh, quickly. So those are the kinds of things you should be looking out for. Runner's feet. A lot of people getting exercise, a lot of people working it to put their wounds that happen from running loss of uh, toenails, things like that. Mm -hmm. What makes that happen? So what runners can our have, runners be aware of? <laughs> runners have an array of problems, especially with the nails. You're constantly kind of beating up the nails against the front of the shoe. Um, a lot of my runners have fungal toenails and that's because you know, you're running for a long time, the nail root gets damaged and very sweaty inside your shoes and socks. So that inserts a fungus right there. Um, so they need to be definitely soaking their feet, uh, probably after every run, salt water or um, apple cider vinegar uh, soaks really help. And then they can also do like topical antifungal kind of treatments for their nails to help kind of control that as well as um, powders or creams that can prevent the athlete's foot. Um, and beginning runners too, they have problems when it comes to stress fractures. Like stress fractures are a pretty, pretty bad thing that I think is a little underrated. Um, if you're trying to get back into the working out, if you're trying to have that prevention going on with your health and running is your thing and then you stop because your foot starts to hurt, it's most likely because you probably have a stress fracture going on. Um, so maybe take up cycling instead, swimming, <laughs> something else to kind of get the pressure off until your your uh, weight is down enough so you can sustain the pounding. You know, the, there's a beautiful uh, spirit that comes across as you prescribe uh, treatment. And I think the other thing for those who missed it, she's like, you know, like put a little lotion on your feet, wash your feet. <laughs> um, I, I, I think those things are underrated. I think here it is, you know, you're in your shoes all day or you're in your house all day. Then all of a sudden you really think, well, I don't have to wash, but a few areas of my body. And before you know it, you've kind of grown a green toe or something. And it clearly is not a solution. So for all of you watching, she did say lotion. <laughs> she did say to wash. She did say to soak. So you yeah. have, H this is free. Like literally, <laughs> this is free. They're your feet, so take better care of your feet. The other thing that I, I would like for you to share is just the whole idea of stretching your toes and feet and self-inspection. So how important is it to massage and stretch your feet as we move through our days? Well, you mean the feet are the foundation of everything and there are a number of joints and tendons and bones in your foot that are holding your whole entire body. 
so definitely I stretch my Achilles tendons like every day. I stretch them and I do my little toe stretches on the walls and things of that nature just to make sure that my muscles are awake and that I'm limber enough to keep it moving. Um, so yeah, I think that people definitely need to um, stretch their feet, but most importantly, wear supportive shoes so you're not overextending anything either. You could easily get tendonitis or some type of ligament or tendon strain if you're not wearing the proper shoes. So everybody wants to know, what does it feel like to be on the show? You know, it's, it feel, I feel really blessed to be on the show. I, it, this is something that I was just not expecting in a million years that would ever happen. I, um, I kind of stepped out on faith and started as an independent contractor working as a podiatrist. And I was in charge of just kind of building my, my practice up. And I think that once I kind of started to make some traction about that, that's how the show found me. And they were like, well, you, you explain stuff well, and you know, you do a good job with patients. So why don't you make a show about it? You know? So I, I'm super, super blessed to have um, been chosen to be on the show and I think representation definitely matters. And so I don't take it lightly that I know that a lot of little black girls are looking up at me and like thinking, maybe I can be a doctor now. It's not that far out of reach, you know? So I definitely don't take it lightly. I like get chills every time I see someone like looking at my, sh my TV show and, you know, and they're little and it's just, it's so humbling and such a blessing. Well, for people who want to look at the show, there are unbelievable things in store for them this year. I, yeah. I really want our community to educate. What can they look forward to seeing? Obviously, we want them to understand that you're there to help, you know, with things like what? So there's a lot of things this season on the show that are just... Uh, a bit abnormal. I think first season you could see a little bit more of the everyday kind of things that happen, you know, like the fungal toenails, the bunions, the hammer toes. Um, this season it's a little more extreme in the sense that we're dealing with people who were born with uh, pretty rare conditions. Um, there's a person that was born with uh, hemihypertrophy, uh, basically a condition that makes you have uh, one limb that's much larger than the other and you grow like several, several tumors in there. What can be done about that? You'll see on the show. Um, there's other people who've been, unfortunately, in several accidents, like burn victims, had past surgery in, in the past that kind of fixed it, but not all the way. So you're kind of figuring out what would be the best option for this patient to just get out of pain. Um, at the moment, like some people are like, oh, we want to see the foot transform. Like we want it to be magically transformed. And my objective, I want it to look good too, but hey, let's get you out of pain. You know, like what hurts you? So um, you'll see a lot of that this season as well. Um, you know. Freeman it's, syndrome, it's elephant, Titus, all of these things. What are they and how can our community know when they need to see you? Um, so tree man syndrome is just very, very rare. I, I doubt we'll see a, a lot of people with that condition, but um, you know you need to see me if things are painful for at least two weeks on your foot. If, don't let something fester in pain. I don't want people coming like they do on the show sometimes. It's been five years and this same thing is hurting. Like, no, come after two weeks and we'll take care of it then. <laughs> um, you need to see me if there's anything that... Um, is an acute injury. If you've fallen, if you've had can, like bruising, swelling, anything like that, you need to come see me for um, any soft tissue bumps or lumps that come upon your foot, definitely come in and we'll take care of it. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, everybody wants to know, we showed them at the beginning of Health IQ uh, that Gregory had a little issue or he a did. lot of issue, if you ask me, an onion issue. <laughs> he so, did. I'm glad you said that so that others won't think that their onion feet are okay. Like smells <laughs> and body odors, that that suggests something. Exactly. Um, so Gregory actually, when he first came to me, he looked a lot worse than you saw on TV. He came to see me pre-COVID. And um, essentially, because we couldn't get him into the OR because of COVID, 
I basically sent him home with a bunch of instructions for wound care. And he did a good job. Gregory is probably by far the most compliant patient ever. Um, and so we would be in touch like on telephone, like, hey, are you doing your stuff? Because it's COVID and I don't want you going to the hospital, you know? <laughs> and he was, he was doing his stuff. Um, and so once I was able to uh, actually get him into the surgery center, that's when we started to make moves. And I mean, I threw the kitchen sink at Gregory. I think that there was a lot of people that really um, played a role in helping him get to where he is today, which is amazing. And um, more so than making him feel better, and look better and having a better life. I feel like we became really good friends in the process, you know? No, I have no clue what <laughs> you're talking about. Um, you speak very clearly, doctor. Obviously, you've been recognized, uh, won research awards and, and definitely for your oral presentations, but I'm not surprised. Uh, Howard University, you make us all proud that are HBCU graduates. So I wanna thank you for your healing power and the love that you give. Um, you know, Hampton, no, Hampton. we got the HU wrong, but it's okay. Oh, oh, Howard. It no, that was Howard or Hampton? Hampton. I'm Hampton. kidding. Yeah, <laughs> the other HU. You know, I've got to put a little bit on it to keep y'all You got going. a little, okay. I always want okay. a little bit of that on there. <laughs> but one of my dear friends, Brooke Ellis is a, uh, is a Hampton. Uh, Right, gotcha. yeah. <laughs> Home by the sea. I love it. Well, I want to thank you, and, and I really love your healing powers. I love your commitment to our community more than anything. You let Black girls not know that they could, but they will be. I think that will is be. The beauty. That is the beauty. It will be done. It will manifest. I love it. It, is. I love it, it. will be. It's not, it's not a joke and it's possible and someone can look like you have beautiful hair have a wonderful <laughs> smile care and be concerned and compassionate so i love the compassion i love the communication and for all of you out there on health iq be sure to follow her check out her show Yay. we want you to go mondays <laughs> at nine what? mondays at nine Yes. <laughs> at nine. It is so cool. I really want to thank you, Dr. Abby from Hampton. Uh, we want you to know here at Health IQ, we love you, what you're doing, and that we're very, very, very proud of everything that you do to heal our community and inform us about what we can do about our feet. Your feet are important, and we yeah. want to say thank you. Thank you thank so much. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed this interview. So anytime. See you soon. Peace. See you soon. <laughs> Bye.